Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I'm Laurie Actman with the Penn Center for Innovation. We're very happy to be here for our fifth annual celebration of innovation here at Penn. While of course we'd um, rather be with you in person, we wanted to make sure we took a moment to take a break from our various Zoom calls and meetings and spend some time celebrating some of our collective commercialization accomplishments at Penn this year. It's been quite um, a prolific year despite our challenging circumstances. And I wanted to highlight a few of our key metrics. We try to communicate through our year in review, which hopefully some of you have seen. Um, we really were um, able to utilize our faculty and external partners. And obviously none of this could be possible without um, the commitment of my PCI colleagues, steady leadership from our managing director, John Sorley, who you'll hear from later in the program, the unwavering support from Don Bennell, our vice provost for research, and also um, other leaders at Penn, including Penn Medicine on Epstein. PCI helped facilitate over $100 million, actually, um, raised almost $600 million, and of course, we've all heard the news of Dr. Drew Weissman and his discoveries that are a key part of the leading COVID vaccines, his mRNA technology, which he started working on many years ago. And Penn, of course, supported this over the long term. And it's really a great story of the importance of commercialization and universities' role in supporting basic research at Penn. What we always try to do at this event is highlight our prolific faculty who every year, every fiscal year, um, are awarded almost um, 100 patents. And while we don't have time to mention every single one of them today, um, we do want to recognize all of them, and you can see on these slides um, some familiar names and hopefully new names. The numbers after each of their names represent the number of patents they were awarded this year. Um, and there's Dan Powell with his patent cube. We send every faculty patent awardee a patent cube or cubes, depending on how many they get. And um, after five years, um, these cubes are starting to pile up on everyone's desk, um, hopefully helping to spread the commercialization culture here at Penn. Um, Jim Wilson um, was the highest, I guess, patent awardee this year with 13 patents. Uh, but it's really impressive. Um, it takes our faculty time and effort to work with us to um, pursue patent protection with us and our outside counsel. So we want to thank all of you and just acknowledge how important it is that we're pursuing this. Um, these patents are key for the innovation ecosystem here at Penn and in Philadelphia and um, continue to be very important for the future of commercialization at Penn. So thank you, and um, we're very happy to work with you and to continue to do so, uh, obviously, over the coming years. So um, now I wanted to um, introduce my colleague, Ben Dibling, PCI's Deputy Managing Director, um, for the next part of the program. Thanks so much, Laurie. Uh, thanks so much for the introduction. I'd, I'd also like to echo uh, the welcome to everyone joining virtually today. Uh, we're, we're here to recognize the wide ranging contributions of our faculty, postdocs, staff and students to the development of new technologies that have either already formed the basis of or will likely be developed into new products and services to the benefit of the public. We're also here to acknowledge the support of commercial partners, investors and, and entrepreneurs who have helped to advance these endeavors. Um, it goes without saying, but, but 2020 has been an unprecedented year in which the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic has necessitated a shift in all of our practices and priorities. Um, Dr. Epstein will speak to this in greater detail, uh, but it's 
been amazing to see the emergence of new research programs at Penn and the pivoting of existing programs um, really across the entire Penn campus, you know, with a focus on developing creative ways to diagnose, treat, and prevent the spread of COVID-19 infections. Here at PCI, we've similarly prioritized our activities to support the development of these innovations. Just a few examples of the team's activities include what I would describe as rapid and, and seamless negotiation of sponsored research agreements and material transfer agreements to allow faculty to evaluate the efficacy of new potential COVID therapeutics, uh, protecting and marketing novel COVID diagnostic technologies to potential commercial partners and investors, and negotiating licenses to Penn IP for new COVID vaccines. It's really been incredibly rewarding to be part of the PCI team in support of Penn's innovation engine that is focused on addressing really the myriad of challenges presented by this pandemic. I'd like to extend a specific thanks to all the members of my licensing and corporate contracting teams who have worked selflessly and tirelessly to facilitate these critical business arrangements to effectively battle the impacts of COVID-19. Um, with that all said, um, I, I'd really like to extend a very warm welcome to our keynote speaker, Dr. John Epstein, Executive Vice Dean and Chief Scientific Officer of the Perlman School of Medicine. John and his team at the Perlman School of Medicine continue to be actively engaged and vocal supporters of PCI, for which we're all incredibly appreciative. And um, with that, I'll hand you over to John. Thank you. Ben, thank you uh, so much. Uh, Lori, uh, John Swartley, uh, the entire PCI team, thanks for doing this event. Uh, thanks for helping us with all of our uh, discoveries and making them have real impact in society. And uh, it's just been wonderful to see the progress over the last number of years. And you can see it in the region, just looking around at the growth in biotech, uh, the number of companies that have spun out of Penn, the changing landscape and the changing skyline uh, all around us. And uh, it, it's exciting. And I know that from the faculty in the Perlman School of Medicine, uh, the culture has changed dramatically in the sense that uh, many of us believe that uh, in our lifetime, we can have impact with our discoveries and we can see them turn into new drugs and, uh, uh, or new devices. And uh, to see uh, the growing number of FDA approvals for uh, new therapeutics that are coming out of the laboratories uh, gives everybody uh, uh, heart and uh, uh, drums up enthusiasm for even harder work. And that's never been more the case than uh, during the last difficult uh, number of months uh, in response to the uh, COVID pandemic. And so I thought I would try to give a summary of some of the activities that have been underway uh, really by way of update uh, for people. And I'll, I'll share my slides to uh, um, give you some of that information. Uh, Laurie already mentioned the exciting work from uh, Drew Weissman, who, uh, with his uh, um, colleague, uh, Catalin Carrico, who was at Penn and uh, went to BioNTech, uh, has become the, the latest uh, overnight sensation that uh, was 20 years in the making. Uh, uh, Drew and his team uh, figured out how to stabilize RNA with modified nucleotides and to uh, prevent the uh, um, type of immune reaction that you don't want when you use RNA as a therapeutic uh, so that it can elicit an appropriate uh, uh, immune response when being delivered uh, to develop a vaccine. And that is the basis for both the Moderna and the BioNTech slash Pfizer uh, vaccine that we've read so much about. And, uh, uh, for those of you who know Drew, he's most comfortable in his laboratory doing his work, uh, really remarkable work, uh, but he's been all over the press recently being interviewed on uh, TV and, and radio, and it's a delight to see him getting the recognition uh, that, that he deserves. And my prediction is more to come. One of the most exciting things to me about the advances that have led to these vaccines is that it validates the notion of RNA being used as a therapeutic 
uh, way beyond uh, the COVID vaccine or vaccines in general. Uh, I think we'll see uh, many, many people, millions of people getting RNA, modified RNA, packaged in lipid nanoparticles as part of uh, these COVID vaccines. And that will uh, provide a lot of confidence that the delivery of modified RNAs for other therapeutic purposes is something that can be uh, actively pursued. There are all, already uh, at least one other medicine for an orphan disease that uses uh, this type of approach, but I think we're gonna see this boom over the next number of years, uh, rivaling cell and gene therapy. And uh, let's see it uh, uh, be part of the growing ecosystem in the Philadelphia area. <clears throat> So uh, um, this graphic gives you a, a sense of the sort of playbook that we've been following in the uh, School of Medicine and with our partner schools, uh, engineering, veterinary, nursing, uh, Wharton, and, and uh, arts and sciences in particular uh, to uh, combat this uh, epidemic. Um, early on, of course, we, we had to depopulate our research buildings as uh, everybody had to do in their businesses. But at the same time, we had several thousand essential personnel uh, working, never mind the healthcare workers who were taking care of the ill patients. And we got to work immediately on developing rapid diagnostic tests, serology assays that we used in our healthcare workers uh, very early on in the pandemic and have been following over time, giving us a sense of what percent of people are converting. One of the main take home messages from the serology work was that uh, the uh, uh, mask wearing and social distancing and hand washing really work. Very few of our healthcare workers were exposed uh, uh, and converted uh, uh, at work. In fact, it's more common that they uh, develop uh, COVID in the community than at work even with all the ill patients there because they're following the appropriate protocols. And that gave us confidence to extend those protocols aggressively across the rest of the school. There have been enormous efforts in developing better therapies. I'll tell you more about the use of convalescent plasma. Of course, you've read about and we have ongoing trials. We've been screening all approved FDA drugs in a biosafety level three laboratory where live virus is used in cultured lung cells. Sarah Cherry leading that effort and identifying some surprising hits that we're now taking forward into clinical trials. One of those, uh, for example, is cyclosporin that is uh, normally thought of as an immunosuppressant, but Sarah has shown that it has antiviral activity uh, uh, mediated by a part of the molecule unrelated to the part of the molecule that mediates its immunosuppressive effects. And it may in fact be useful early in the disease as an antiviral, and late in the disease as an immunosuppressant. Um, we have an enormous clinical trial infrastructure at Penn with over 2000 ongoing clinical trials. Uh, and um, uh, as I've mentioned, a lot of experience in obtaining FDA approval for new drugs through our clinical trial network. And uh, that network pivoted quickly to set up a series of clinical trials uh, for uh, COVID uh, medications. And of course, understanding the fundamental biology Susan Weiss and others have been studying coronaviruses for 40 years and brought that understanding to bear to try to understand how uh, this uh, new coronavirus was working. Jim Wilson and his team pivoted their efforts, uh, and I'll say a little more about that uh, in a minute. And we've already touted some of the vaccine efforts. Uh, uh, there are a series of other vaccine efforts as well at the Wistar Institute uh, and at Penn uh, that uh, um, have been moving forward as well. <clears throat> um, very early on, we set up a new center at Penn called the Center for Coronavirus and Other Emerging Pathogens. And I underscore the other emerging pathogens part of the title, because from the very start, we appreciated that this was not going to be the last pandemic. And uh, uh, there were lessons to be learned from this one. Uh, that hopefully we can apply to future pandemics so that we can respond faster and better than we've done as a society in this case. And that's part of the goal of our new center. They help to organize and align well over 100 independent laboratories 
who are pivoting their efforts to work on coronavirus, including my own. Uh, I'm a cardiologist and stem cell biologist, and we'd never worked on viral pathogens, but we have been over the last number of months, uh, learning that when the uh, spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 binds to its receptor, ACE2, which is normally an enzyme, it's an enzyme involved in regulation of the circulatory system, so I knew something about it. Uh, what we learned is that the activity of that enzyme is altered by spike protein binding. It's actually accelerated when the, when the uh, virus binds. And we think that that may have something to do with some of the um, uh, signs and symptoms of the disease because it acts as a protease that cleaves downstream factors, including angiotensin, but also bradykinin and other factors. And we continue to explore that. We were lucky enough to have a, a, a terrific outpouring of support from friends of the university who uh, provided an enormous amount of philanthropy that drove the science because uh, we wanted to get to work faster than grants could allow. And uh, much of the early research and the ongoing research is uh, fueled by philanthropic donations, including building out our biosafety level three laboratories uh, and animal care facilities so that we can develop animal models of COVID for additional testing. And we held a series of symposium, including one uh, that Tony Fauci gave the uh, keynote for uh, that had thousands of people attending online. One of the silver linings, I think, of all of us working remotely is that it's easier to join these symposia. And we're reaching people in many, many countries overseas who hear about uh, these events and log on. So, uh, that's something I predict will persist after the pandemic is over. And we've uh, utilized some of the new tests that we've developed to begin screening workers in the School of Medicine uh, through a testing program called COVID Safe that is supplementing a larger testing program called Project Quaker that I'll mention as well for testing of students and uh, staff and faculty as well. Um, I want to highlight uh, the response of Penn Health Tech, an institute that we started a number of years ago, bridging between the School of Engineering and the School of Medicine, focused primarily on developing medical devices. They really put all their efforts to work to try to address the needs of the healthcare community uh, taking on COVID. In the early days, that was making face shields and face masks. Uh, figuring out ways of expanding our ventilator capacity, uh, of decontaminating PPE when we didn't have enough of it, of making telemedicine carts so that doctors didn't have to be uh, uh, enter patients' rooms all the time, but could have essentially robots doing some of that work. And uh, we were able to purchase, again, with philanthropic support, uh, a whole array of butterfly ultrasound units for point of care ultrasound that plug into your iPhone. These are developed by Jonathan Rothberg, the discoverer, or the, the inventor of um, uh, uh, next gen sequencing, who's also started this company to make handheld ultrasounds. And this allowed uh, emergency room personnel and uh, critical care doctors to uh, look at the lungs of, of patients presenting with COVID without having to send them to the ultrasound suites which would then need to be decontaminated between each patient. So literally while patients were waiting in the emergency room, they could start getting the necessary scans to determine the severity of their illness. Again, uh, one of the things that'll come out of this pandemic that I think will persist in the longer term, uh, this type of um, device will be in much greater use. Here's just a picture of some of the 3D printing of face shields and origami masks that were developed in the uh, early uh, days. I'll mention briefly just a, a couple of ongoing activities uh, involving contact tracing and Pen Open Pass. You're all familiar with Pen Open Pass, and that was developed internally by uh, a number of individuals, including Kevin Volpe and Carolyn Canuschio, who've been working very closely with the city of Philadelphia to expand their contact tracing capabilities uh, in the region. And uh, uh, our region, like so many around the country, was really not prepared in terms of public health infrastructure to stand up and perform the necessary contact tracing. And the Penn team weighed in and has provided tremendous support uh, in that uh, process. 
um, uh, I challenged a team of uh, basic science uh, um, researchers led by Rick Bushman, our chair of microbiology and one of the co-directors of the new coronavirus center to come up with a rapid uh, COVID-19 test that would be inexpensive and that would not rely on the same supply chain limitations that have bedeviled so many of the clinical laboratory tests, the commercial tests. And uh, that team uh, responded in a, in a really wonderful way, coming up with a lamp mediated assay that is linear isothermal amplification that is a little different than polymerase chain reaction, uses a different polymerase uh, to detect the viral RNA sequence. And uh, uh, to avoid uh, having to purchase the enzymes uh, at, at relatively high cost, and again, with potential supply chain problems, um, Greg Van Dyne and his biochemistry laboratory synthesized bucket loads of the enzymes that we need and continues to do so, so that we can uh, use them at an exceedingly low cost. Uh, they also came up with a really cool trick to detect the amplified uh, uh, sequences uh, to increase specificity. And that is they, they developed something called molecular beacons that are a dumbbell shaped uh, oligonucleotide with a floor at one end and a quencher at the other end so that it doesn't fluoresce detectably at baseline. But when that dumbbell shaped oligonucleotide opens up and binds to its cognate sequence, uh, it fluoresces. And that allows high specificity of detection and a very easy fluorescent detection method. In fact, one that can be uh, adjusted to be seen by the eye. And we're working now to make it a point of care test where you could just see the solution turn a color uh, if it's testing positive. Um, uh, separately, Cesar de la Fuente Nunez, a relatively new assistant professor who we recruited from MIT with expertise in uh, chemical engineering, as well as microbiology, uh, developed a fantastic test that we're still trying to scale and uh, commercialize, which uh, involves printing an electrode that uh, with a functionalized ACE2 receptor on it that can detect minute amounts of a virus uh, using a desktop instrument, a potentiostat or a smaller version of that detection instrument that plugs into your iPhone. And it detects the uh, virus in saliva or in nasal secretions uh, in about four minutes. And there's no preparation of the fluid that's needed first. You just put it directly onto the printed electrode. The total cost for each electrode is under $5. And uh, a single screen printer can print about 50,000 electrodes in a day. So we've just purchased our own screen printer. We're getting it set up. He has a manuscript submitted on this and a patent filed. And uh, I hope that with that before too long, we could be distributing these electrodes and uh, people could be testing themselves across our campus, perhaps initially as part of a clinical trial as we seek EUA authorization and uh, appropriate approvals from the FDA and CLIA. So there's really exciting work going on in this domain and others as well. I'll mention one more in just a minute or two. This novel testing capacity team is working uh, uh, alongside a larger group of, uh, called Project Quaker that I won't speak more about, but I just wanna put it in the context of the clinical laboratories scaling up dramatically to test uh, our uh, community here at Penn and to help uh, be able to, to function the university uh, safely and effectively. I mentioned the enormous amount of philanthropy that's come in, much of it going directly to research and clinical trials. And we're really grateful to the over 450 donors who've been contributing to our COVID relief fund. <clears throat> um, I mentioned that Jim Wilson pivoted his team to work on COVID. You may have read that he just signed a deal with Regeneron to use their sequences that encode their antibodies that they uh, have approved for uh, delivering to COVID patients. But it's hard to manufacture enough of those antibodies to give to all the people who need them. And Jim has been proposing to 
uh, deliver the sequence for those antibodies in an AAV vector that would infect uh, uh, by inhalation your respiratory epithelium, making a sort of bioshield of protective antibodies on the surface of your respiratory epithelium, preventing COVID infection. And that work is underway. John Wary has been leading serology and immune profiling efforts to better understand uh, how the body responds to the virus. And this is gonna be part of a bigger effort. The pen is a world leader in immunology. And we believe that the immune system is a built-in sensor in your body that tells you when you're sick or how you're responding to treatments. If only we knew how to read the language of the immune system in more detail. And by uh, deep profiling of immunophenotypes, we're learning how to do that. And COVID is a great example of what we can learn. He's divided patients into three broad categories and how their immune systems respond that uh, predicts outcomes. A series of randomized clinical trials. I won't go into the details for time's sake now, but uh, uh, Ravi Amravati and many others have been performing really high quality randomized trials. In this case, proving like everybody else that hydroxychloroquine doesn't work. But I think the, the, the uh, hallmark is the fact that they're double-blinded, placebo-controlled, well-conducted uh, trials that are uh, uh, definitive in their answers. And the same is being true for convalescent plasma. Thousands of patients have gotten convalescent plasma, and yet very few blinded clinical trials have been published. We really need more and better data. So uh, developing and testing the vaccines will be uh, an ongoing effort. Uh, they'll be uh, uh, starting to be delivered very soon. And uh, frontline healthcare workers, people working in nursing homes, uh, first responders will be the first to get them and will expand that as fast as possible thereafter. We're uh, uh, likely to be a site for the uh, uh, Pfizer vaccine and we're putting aside freezers because that's the one that has to be stored cold uh, to, to uh, um, deliver those. And we're planning to couple uh, the delivery of those vaccines in trials to this deep immunophenotyping to understand the response not only to disease, but to treatment and vaccination. Um, I'll just highlight uh, with these numbers, some of the real successes for the Penn Center for Innovation. Uh, one thing that's not often appreciated is how often the deals they help us make bring back sponsored research agreements from uh, uh, the private sector to continue to fuel basic research at Penn. $116 million in the last year uh, coming in to support our research efforts. Uh, that's a very significant uh, number. And I think Penn is getting uh, international recognition for the efforts that PCI has been undertaking. Um, so uh, just to close up, uh, here's a few images. Uh, uh, Ping Wang, uh, I haven't mentioned yet, but she's developed yet another ultra fast, ultra sensitive uh, antigen test that can be read out on your iPhone uh, that she's working to commercialize. A picture of uh, uh, some of the laboratories, such as those where we're uh, performing COVID safe now on thousands of individuals in the school uh, with capacity up to several thousand tests a day. We've just moved it to once weekly testing and we continue to expand it broadly with a second saliva collection center opening soon. And uh, this is a picture of the bottom of Cesar de la Fuente's electrode with its little potentiostat adapter plugged into the iPhone that I hope we'll be seeing more of before too long. I do think these point of care diagnostics will be on the scene before uh, too very long and they're badly needed. So I'll stop there. Thanks very much for the chance to uh, comment today and uh, uh, congratulations to PCI and to all of the uh, entrepreneurs and innovators who have joined today. Uh, John, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and providing such a comprehensive view, which uh, many of us have not yet seen of the breadth of Penn's um, response to COVID-19 uh, across all of Penn Medicine and the university. And, um, you know, I'm sure I speak for many people when I say not only am I very thankful to be part of Penn, but very proud to be part of Penn right now, given all the ways we're contributing to solutions. And um, just thank you for your partnership um, with PCI and um, all you do to support us. 
So um, now we're actually going to move on to the special awards part of the program. And I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Michael Poisel, who's the direct executive director of PCI Ventures. Thank you, Lori. I'm very happy to be a part of the celebration today for all of our great inventors. And for my part to highlight Exxon Technologies for Deal of the Year Award. This past year, they completed a, a partnership with Sandvik the largest mining operating company in the world. Uh, they provide equipment and uh, operations to uh, many mines uh, throughout the entire world. And what this partnership does is it positions Exxon's autonomous GPS denied aerial robotics as the go-to solution for mining visualization. Uh, it really sets them up as standing above and beyond the rest of their competitors. And we're very proud of all of the great work that Exxon has done I am proud to join PCI in extending the award to Rafi Jabern on behalf of Exxon Technologies. And we'll ask Rafi to speak a little bit about the significance of this partnership and the development of Exxon as a whole. Excellent, thank you, Mike. And uh, there's the award. It mm -hmm. made it all the way to Canada. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, uh, first of all, we're very proud to be associated with Penn and its rich history. Um, anytime we're doing any sort of presentation and we mention that we're associated with Penn, it carries a lot of weight, uh, a little bit like this award, which is actually quite heavy, to be honest. Um, but uh, yeah, it does carry a lot of weight. And we, when we say, you know, we're associated with Penn and we're a spinoff and, uh, you know, inevitably Dr. Vijay's name comes up and uh, lots of great stories come out. So we're very, very happy about that. And uh, as mentioned, we hope that this is going to pave the way for Exxon Technologies to become a household name in the mining industry. Um, I've uh, had the benefit of working in mining for a number of years and Sandvik has always been one of the front runners in how they actually go ahead with their uh, innovation. And I think Exxon is now gonna up that ante because what we're doing in mining has never been done before. We really feel that we can turn the industry on its head and uh, really make Penn proud with uh, with what we're able to accomplish. So thank you again. And uh, I think you'll be hearing a lot from uh, Exxon Technologies down the road. Great, um, thank you so much for joining us today and congrats to all of you um, for everything uh, Exxon has accomplished over the past few years. Um, a great pen success story without a doubt. Um, next, I'd like to introduce um, my colleague, Melissa Kelly, the Director of Licensing with PCI. Thanks, Lori. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce this year's recipient of the Emerging Inventor of the Year Award, Michelle Ku of Penn Dental Medicine. Michelle came to Penn in 2013, and with him, he brought a robust research program directed at understanding, controlling, and eradicating the biofilm particularly the biofilm which occurs in our mouths and leads to cavities. Since his arrival, he has built an extensive portfolio of technologies, the first of which has led to the issue patent that is the subject of this award, the first, I expect, of many. Michelle's research has piqued the interest not only of internal stakeholders by way of an award from Penn Health Tech in the 2018 cohort, but also external partners in the form of multiple industry-sponsored research agreements. I have to say that working with Michelle over these last several years has been a delight. He is one of the most collaborative researchers I've known and surrounds himself with talented individuals from across various disciplines. In fact, if you were to take a look at the patent families we have filed on Michelle's technologies, you would find that virtually all of them list co-inventors from schools across campus, including engineering, medicine and others. With this in mind, it should come as no surprise that Michelle has spearheaded a collaborative initiative with the School of Engineering to create the Center for Innovation and Precision Dentistry, which is set to launch in January, 2021. I look forward to seeing Michelle revolutionize the field of oral health care. And who knows, maybe we'll all benefit from his innovations in the near future. But for now, please join me in congratulating Penn's Emerging Inventor of the Year, Michelle Koo. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, thank you, PCI. Um, it has been, it is an honor uh, to receive this award right here, right on my table. 
as I mentioned earlier, very heavy, probably the most beautiful award I ever received. Um, thank you so much. Um, and I think this award uh, is very special uh, for two reasons. It, it opened up you know, a gamut of collaborations, particularly with School of Engineering. And I am so thankful to my uh, collaborators, uh, David Cormode and Kate Stabe, which really helped to galvanize this uh, technology. And I just wanna share two, two points here regarding this uh, award. And I think it's very special for two reasons. It just show how collaborations with engineering can lead to completely new ways uh, to address a persisting uh, clinical problem that cannot be solved in conventional ways. It's my distinct privilege to present the award for Startup of the Year to Caballetta Bio, a clinical stage biotechnology company focused on T cell therapies for B cell mediated autoimmune diseases. Within this past year alone, Caballetta Bio completed a $75 million IPO, received orphan drug designation from the FDA for its lead clinical candidate, and significantly expanded its research partnership with Penn. Under the direction of Dr. Amy Payne, the director of the Penn Clinical Autoimmunity Center for Excellence, this expanded research will include three additional B cell mediated autoimmune diseases, building on the foundational technology developed at Penn by Dr. Payne and Dr. Michael Malone, who are both co-founders of Caballetta Bio. Accepting this award on behalf of Caballetta Bio is Dr. Steven Nickberger, the company's CEO and a co-founder, whose leadership and expertise have been instrumental in Caballetta's success. So once again, congratulations to our 2020 Startup of the Year, Caballetta Bio, and I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Steve Nickberger. With Mark at, at quarterback, we engaged with Carl June and his expanded team uh, with Don Siegel and CVPF to help us manufacture because we didn't have manufacturing facilities. We needed them for a cell therapy. Penn has that. Penn is expert at that. Penn supports us in that and enabled us to much more capital efficiently pursue the goal of treating patients. Uh, we needed to work with Emma and her team on the regulatory and clinicals. So we didn't have that yet. Uh, and we've evolved the, the relationships to the point now where we're an independent company working side by side with Penn, advancing far more than we could have without. Um, there, there's a lot of people who I'm probably leaving out, um, but I do want to say that um, it all starts with the science. It all starts with the scientists. And um, it, it's your passion that fuels the interest of the great management teams, of the great investors, and by partnering with trusted colleagues at PCI, sounds a bit like an announcement, but they, they paid me to do it. Um, the, the, by partnering with people at PCI to secure the intellectual property at first, that's the, that's the key. If you secure the intellectual property, the investors become interested, the management team shows up, and all of a sudden you, you've created something that's far greater than any one of us can create by ourselves. So um, in a way, I guess PCI for Cavaletta uh, was a great enabler. And um, I, I wanna thank you for the recognition, but you can see from my comments, um, the recognition should be around all of you as scientists and as innovators and as PCI as an enabler. So um, on behalf of everybody in the company, on behalf of Amy and Mike who co-founded the company, uh, thanks for the recognition. Thanks so much, Stephen, and congrats on all the amazing progress and success that you've made as a company um, this year, including a very exciting IPO. Um, so it's great for Penn and Philadelphia. Um, next, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Mark Inglica, our Associate Director of Corporate Alliances. So I'm, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to introduce Sar Gill, Assistant Professor of Medicine as the recipient of this year's uh, Inventor of the Year Award. Sar Gill joined Penn in 2011 as a medical fellow and launched this independent lab in 2013, focusing on cell therapies for uh, hematologic malignancies. Um, he didn't waste any time upon arrival at Penn in 2011 to begin innovating, contributing to his first invention disclosure uh, submitted to PCI in December of 2012. Over the last eight years, SAR has contributed to 50 disclosures submitted to our office. And given the short time frame of eight years, this alone is an impressive amount of innovation. However, it's really the quality and the diversity of those disclosures that raise SAR's level of innovation to a level that um, merits receipt of this award. Um, 
PCI has decided to proceed with a patent filing on 42 of those 50 disclosures, which uh, uh, is a rate of 84%, which is quite high. And as many of you in the audience can probably attest, PCI doesn't file on everything. Um, of those 42 patent filings, 38 of those are licensed or optioned to one or more of five companies, two of which uh, SAR is a co-founder. Um, when we receive a disclosure from SAR, you can bet it's good and you can bet it has uh, commercial legs. While we focused on, while, while, while he's focused on the cell therapy space, SAR's inventions show remarkable diversity, pushing the boundaries of cell therapies into new cell types, such as CAR macrophages, which form the basis of Charisma Therapeutics, a $50 million startup formed by SAR Gill and Michael Kuczynski in 2017. Um, pushes the boundaries of cell therapies into new in indications such as autoimmune disease, neurodegenerative disease, and acute myeloid leukemia or AML. Um, we hope to be the first to test the AML therapy, which involves a unique combination of genetic engineering and bone marrow transplant in the clinic at Penn Medicine in the coming year. And finally, SAR is pushing the boundaries of cell therapies uh, into the manufacturing space, creating in vivo viral delivery of such therapies, which form the basis of STAR's latest venture, venture Interius Biotherapeutics. If successful, this technology will lead to the direct patient administration of certain cell and gene therapies, significantly reducing the time and costs associated with current cell therapy manufacturing. So with great pleasure, I'm happy to present the much deserved 2020 Inventor of the Year Award to STAR Gill. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um, I sound amazing the way you put it. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, so I guess this is the closest I'm going to come to an Oscar. So here it is, somewhere near the grass that I'm sitting in front of. Um, and thank you very much for the kind words, Mark. I, I assume that when you see a disclosure for me, you, you, you pull your hair out or something. Um, <laughs> and um, so really, thank you, actually, Mark and, and your whole team for all the support and, and help over the last uh, nine years since coming here. And thank you also to the broader pen medicine infrastructure because it is a place that allows people like me and many others on, on this, um, in this forum to really flourish because of the resources that are available, the type of people that are around and, and be it just for a, a conversation that might spark ideas or be it for a formal collaboration or anything in between that then leads to disclosures, patents, uh, new companies perhaps, and certainly new therapies or devices or diagnostics for patients. And so uh, th this has been an incredible ecosystem. Really, um, 11 years ago um, when I moved to the States and nine years ago when I came here, I could not have imagined that, um, that I'd be at a place like this. Um, so I really thank you very much and thanks for nominating me and I look forward to working with you more in the future. Thanks so much, Sar. Um, those really are some incredible um, accomplishments and um, conversion of ideas into commercialization impact. So truly deserved. Um, thank you so much. And last but not least, I'm um, very pleased to introduce John Swartley, PCI's Managing Director, to present our last award, which um, is extra special this year. So um, I'm, I'm so proud and, and, and truly honored this year to present the final award um, for Partner of the Year. Uh, some of you may, may recall that the past recipients of this award have, 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 have included some of Penn's most significant uh, alliance partners, R&D alliance partners, and, and our long-term venture capital funding partners. This year, we're going to take a little bit of a different track, and we're, we're honoring a singularly successful partnership that was formed inside of Penn to carry forward a critical component of President Gutman's and the, and the Penn trustees' vision for supporting and encouraging innovation here at, here at Penn. Um, it's this is particularly po poignant this year uh, because we've also decided to name th this award uh, from this point forward um, in honor of someone who, who represented the, the very best of the partnership spirit at Penn, uh, Paul Sainer. Uh, most of us at PCI met Paul, Paul when he was the director of real estate uh, development at Penn's uh, facilities and re real estate services group. And, and he was managing the newly purchased 23 acre property directly south of campus, the medical school campus, which is uh, previously occupied by DuPont's Marshall Labs. Back then, what eventually became 
what is now known as the Penovation Works site was mainly defunct buildings and, and, and raw potential. But Paul was, uh, was an enthusiastic partner who had tremendous drive and vision. And uh, he worked closely with us to create opportunities for some of our fledgling startup companies who didn't really have any other uh, real estate options. And, and, and that turned out to be pivotal, pivotal for such num number of them. And Paul was a fantastic partner in that regard. As the Penovation Works project team grew to include leadership and participants from lots of different groups across, across Penn, including the EVP's office, the Facilities and Real Estate Services Group, the Office of Government Relations, uh, the Vice Provost for Research Office, and, and, and my own organization, PCI. That original spark and spirit of partnership that was demonstrated so well by Paul grew and blossomed into the vibrant and, and growing incubator and accelerator facility we all know um, today. Paul um, sadly lost his battle with cancer in, in 2019, but his legacy lives on in the spirit of partnership and innovation at Penn, and that is truly represented in this ward. So uh, it gives me great pleasure to, to ask Ann Papa George, who's my superb colleague, friend, and an exemplary partner, and is the vice president for Penn's facilities and real estate services. And uh, she will be accepting the, the, the award on behalf of Innovation Works. Thank you, John, for your uh, kind words and, and really for the recognition of Paul uh, in the renaming uh, of this award. This effort did not happen by Paul or Frez. Uh, alone. This was a true collaboration uh, across many organizations at Penn. Uh, first and foremost, yours, uh, John. Uh, when we started about six years ago, uh, this was an idea and we had never really done it before. We had never really had a client to help us define what it is we wanted to do here. We were to a degree educating ourselves in how others have done it, and then trying to apply uh, that knowledge and information to how it would work best at Penn. So thank you for uh, that acknowledgement. Uh, I think that uh, the 23 acres that we see today, you can't, I, I, it's hard to imagine how it was just six uh, short years ago. Uh, we talked about creating a place where ideas go to work uh, and to create an ecosystem where large companies, small startups, researchers, entrepreneurs could all learn from one another and coexist um, in a place that could leverage, uh, connect and leverage the opportunities that Penn's uh, research and technology offers. So the partnership with your group, uh, with the Ventures Group, part of the Penn Innovation Center um, has truly uh, in many ways exceeded my initial expectations. Uh, you know, you have these growth projections that marketing studies, uh, you know, tell you uh, that you can achieve and we've exceeded uh, those projections. But, but the other thing that has been great is that we've brought in other partners like the addition of the JPOT two years ago and Johnson & Johnson uh, Innovation um, becoming part of that collaboration. And, and spreading all of uh, the great work that happens uh, at Penn and at PCI uh, through all of the various conferences uh, from South by Southwest and, uh, and the various bio, life sciences bio conferences, Philly Tech Week, the, the programming that has been um, developed and grown through your organization uh, and 1776. And then all of the support for the young companies um, and uh, the legal financing uh, advising. There are so many stories uh, to tell and we're excited that we now have a new lab building that is uh, just about finished. And, and our hope is that we can continue uh, to grow companies here uh, at Penovation Works. Um, and I want to thank uh, you know, our leadership, Dr. Gutman, Craig, Dawn, um, our collaboration with Mike Borda and Olivia from the Vice Provost for Research, obviously from your organization, in addition to you, John, Lori, uh, Ackman, Mike Pozell, Jamie Sweet, and from my office, in addition to Paul, you know, Ed Datz, uh, Anish Kumar, uh, who has big shoes to fill, um, but has really joined our team 
uh, with enthusiasm. Uh, and then the supporting group from my team, Laura Park-Smith, Steve Becker, Der Dennis Flannery, and Jen Rizzi, who handle all of the day-to-day uh, -day operations. Uh, and then our partners in Joan Lang LaSalle, 1776, and at, at JPOT. So uh, we, I do think um, we've created the community uh, that we set out to create, but there's more room for growth. This year, like no other, uh, the commitment to collaboration uh, really shows uh, how important the collaborative work can be to advancing uh, all of the work that each individual does, but also that, we, that our institution does. So thank you very much. And um, I will proudly share this and display this in the office. Great, thank you so much. And um, John, I'll hand it to you for the last word today. Thanks again, Laurie. Uh, so, uh, what a wonder, wonderful pro program! I'm I'm just beside myself. I, I, and 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 I'd love to thank. I, I really need to thank Laurie and her team for pulling this together. Um, it's an incredibly successful event, totally virtual format, which of course we did not anticipate when we started thinking about this probably a year ago. Um, thank you, Dr. Epstein, for providing such an excellent keynote, keynote address. Um, thanks to all the presenters and the recipients this year. A uh, big note of thanks to my own team at PCI, um, whose tireless work in support of all the inventors, entrepreneurs, and innovators at Penn is greatly appreciated, not only by, by me, but I know by uh, all the members of, of Penn's leadership um, core. And of course, thanks to all of you, uh, the brilliant creators, translators, and teachers, and I, I emphasize teachers, who make, who make all of this possible in, in, in the first place. We, we wouldn't be able to do it without you, um, and, and you're really first on our thank list. 2020 has been um, a challenging year like no other, uh, but the spirit of innovation remains very strong and vibrant here at Penn. So here's to looking forward to a much better 2021 um, and to seeing all of you again in person ne next fall. <laughs>